Hey guys, welcome back to Reignited. And this video is a very special video because we are once again starting a new project. We have a 2006 Ram 2500 with a 5.9 liter Cummins diesel. I know a lot of you guys were hoping I'd jump into another Hemi project, but that is coming down the line. In this case, I want to get back into the diesel world. I think this is going to be a really fun project and I hope you guys stay with me. Now I can kind of hear you guys talking right now. Did Sky buy another blown up diesel engine? Yeah, I did. I mean, it's kind of what I do. So yeah, in this case, at least I know the engine is bad. Uh, when I purchased it, the guy said it had a knock noise, probably bottom end. They drained the oil out of the thing and they had metal particles in the oil. So we kind of know going into this one that it's got something wrong with the bottom end. And so that'll be our first step. I'm gonna go ahead and yank the cab on this thing and pull the engine out and start pulling it apart. Hopefully in this case, when I remove the crankshaft, it will not have damaged the block like it did on that 674 that I rebuilt, which you can see right here. That hopefully that's the case because I really don't want to replace the entire engine on this one. I'm hoping to fix the one that's in there. It only has 165,000 miles on this one. So it'd be really nice to get that one back together again. Overall though, it's a pretty nice truck. It's got a three inch lift on it. It's got some body issues, of course, um, as an older truck will have but it's in pretty decent shape and I'm hoping it'll be a nice flip for me when it's all done. So I really do think there's going to be a lot of you who will be excited about me working on a 5.9 diesel and especially starting to take it all apart and, and go through the process of rebuilding it. But controversial statement incoming, I have a secret for you. Come here, closer. The 5.9 Cummins is not the greatest Cummins ever made. I know, shocking statement and yet it is true. Man, as a technician, I get so tired of people talking about the vaunted 5.9 liter Cummins and how it's the greatest engine that Cummins has ever made. That's not true. It's just not true. Yes, I really, really like the Common Rail 5.9. I think this is a fantastic engine. I love it very much, but it is not better than a 6.7 liter Cummins. All right, bring on the hate, bring on the hate. The 6.7 is better, it just is. The reality is if the 5.9 was the better engine, they'd still be making it, but they're not. They're making the 6.7 because the 6.7 is better. Now, yes, the 6.7 diesel does come with all of the emissions nonsense all over it. Yes, there's more expense involved. Yes, you have the diesel exhaust fluid. Yes, you have this, yes, you have that. There's a lot of costs involved with running a modern diesel, no question about it but that does not change the fact that the 6.7 diesel makes more power and more torque than a 5.9 does, especially if similarly equipped. Now, of course, you can put a tune on these 5.9s, you do all sorts of things, make crazy, crazy power out of them, but if you do the exact same modifications to a 6.7, it's going to make more power. It just is. More displacement is always better. Anyway, just want to clear that up. Get that off my chest. That drives me crazy. People are like, the 59 Cummins is the greatest. No, it's not. It's not. It's a great engine. Fantastic engine. But it's not better than the 6.7. All right. And do not even get me started on the people talking about the 12 valve Cummins engine is the best engine of all time. Oh, that just, that gets me fired up. No question. That drives me crazy. Okay. Yes. If you want an engine that's going to go a million and a half, thousand miles you know sure absolutely but as far as making power goes no okay yes you can make crazy power out of a 12 valve if you dump a boatload of money into it what engine doesn't make a boatload of power if you dump, if you dump a ton of money into it i want you guys to think about this when it comes to the 12 valve engine now that engine was extraordinarily overbuilt for the amount of power it was producing. So therefore it can go a million and a half thousand miles without issue because it's really only performing to a small portion of its potential, correct? Now what happens if you bring the power potential up to where it could be somewhat comparable to a modern diesel engine? Well, your reliability is going to come down. That's how it works. There's always a cost for something like that. So it just drives me nuts when people are like, the 12 valve engine. Stop it with the 12 valve engine. The 12 valve engine is one of the loudest, most annoying engines ever. Drives me nuts, honestly. I had a 1996 Ford 
I thought that engine was loud. And then I bought a 96 12 valve. Good Lord, you cannot hear yourself even think. Once they came out with the common rail design, whew, best thing ever. Really quieted it down with the pilot injection on there. So much better. Again, sorry, tangent on this one. Let's get back to the truck at hand here. Again, first step, I've got to actually remove the entire cab on this thing. Now on these, uh, especially this model, like an 06, you can very easily pull the front end off of these trucks and take the engine out that way rather than pulling the cab. So it's definitely not necessary to pull the cab. However, there's a lot of things that are much, much easier to get to once you pull the cab and it's not that big of a deal to do so. So if you have a lift available to you, 100%, that's the direction you wanna go. If you don't have a lift, yes, you can certainly still do this by pulling the front end assembly off and it's not that bad. Once you get into the 2010 and up Ram trucks, the front end is more of a composite design and it's very much more difficult to take the front pieces out. So it becomes about double the task to pull this stuff off the front on the 2010 and up models. But these models, they're fairly straightforward, pulling the bumper, Pulling the radiator, the uh, um, intercooler, and the evaporator off the front, or sorry, the condenser off the front there. Not too big of a deal. You can pull that all out and then pull the engine out through the front. But another bonus of actually pulling the cab on this thing rather than trying to do it out the front is I don't have a ton of room in front of the vehicle to operate the cherry picker to actually pull the engine straight back out of here. So pulling the cab is great because then I can just lift the engine up and swing the whole cherry picker around with the engine. So anyway, that's our first step. That's what we're going to get into. Then we'll get the engine over there on the bench, get it disassembled and find out exactly what problem we're dealing with. Hope you guys stay with me. As you can see, starting off like gangbusters, <laughs> the underhood padding on here has been attacked by some sort of vicious rodent. Perhaps it may have been a raccoon or a rat, doesn't matter. What matters is that while they tore up the underhood padding there, it does not appear as though they have attacked any of the engine wiring in there. Or so it seems so far. We'll find out once I get further into it. All right, you guys, so the first steps we're going to do in removing the cab here is I'm going to go ahead and recover the AC refrigerant on here. And then I'm going to remove the fan assembly on there and remove both battery boxes and then start disconnecting all the electrical components. And then I'm going to raise the vehicle up and we're going to make sure that the fluids are drained, not only for the engine oil, but also the coolant on there and disconnect the shifter cable on there, disconnect the e-brake cable, anything else, oh, the um, steering shaft on there, we'll go ahead and disconnect that. And at that point, we should be fairly close, and then I'll drop it back down, move the lift to underneath the body itself and start raising it up, and at that point, I'll be able to see if there's anything else that I missed, which there usually is. All right, I have to be honest, this is absolutely disgusting. I'm pulling off this underhood padding, check this out. Oh my God, that is nasty. I don't even want to take that out. That's just gross. I don't want to touch it. So there's been something I wanted to show you guys for a while. And this is one of my all time favorite tools that I have. I actually bought this tool 10 years ago. This was my very first professional tool that I purchased um, to be a professional mechanic. And it's still one of my all time favorites I use today and it's a fan clutch removal tool. If you've ever tried to remove a fan clutch from a vehicle, you know what a huge pain it is because you're supposed to hold the fan pulley with one wrench and then use another wrench to try to break it free. Certainly not an easy proposition, uh, especially on an older vehicle, a diesel. These things are on here extraordinarily tight, so there's gotta be an easier way to remove them, right? Well, there absolutely is. Now, there's several different companies that manufacture this tool. I use one from a brand called Lyle, and in fact, I'll go ahead and link that down below. But again, this tool is 10 years old, and I'll show you exactly how it works. So the kit comes with this variety of different wrench sizes. In this case, it's a 36 millimeter, but it comes with all different sizes, so you can do fan clutches on multiple different vehicles. So that's the wrench itself, and then it comes with the actual piece here. Now the key to this is that you have to have an air hammer or air chisel, whatever people wanna call it. Um, this is essential. So you have to have an air compressor and an air chisel to make this tool work. But once you have it, you will never go back, trust me. All right, so what you do is go ahead and slip the wrench 
over the fan clutch nut, slide that in place. Now, feed that guy in there. And then you just stick the air chisel on it and fire away. And just like that, fan clutch is loose and you can spin it off of there. Now this trick only works if you leave the serpentine belt on because if you take it off, the, the pulley is just going to spin freely. But man, you would not believe how much aggravation that saves. Look at that, that was a three second process to get that thing removed. And now I can just spin it right off. If I was trying to do that by hand, I guarantee you I'd be fighting with that for 20 minutes, trying to hold one wrench, hit the other wrench with a hammer. Total waste of time. This tool, the best. Hey guys, one more quick tip for you. If you're ever going to be removing the steering shaft for any reason, make sure you use a bungee cord or something to hold the steering wheel in place because there is a clock spring behind there. And if it unwinds or gets out of turns, which means if you spin the steering wheel without the steering shaft connected and then reconnect the steering shaft, you're going to break that clock spring in there. When you actually turn the wheel full lock, it's going to snap and that's going to set you an airbag light. So. If you ever, for any reason, are disconnecting the steering shaft, make sure you hold the steering wheel in place so it cannot spin. Hey, and just like that, about two, two and a half hours worth of work and we got the cab off on this thing. Now, I know a lot of Chrysler technicians who could do the same job in about 45 minutes. They really had the process down pat and it's not a big deal for them to just zip right through it and get that cab off. Um, I don't do it quite as often, so it takes me a little bit longer. Like you saw, I kind of really want to make sure that everything is loose. You don't want to go, you know, raising it up and then snapping something and you don't have to. So just going slow, still not a big deal, two and a half hours it's up. So now we're on to the next step. Now I've got to actually remove the front bumper. I've got to start disassembling the engine itself. I want to get the engine pretty much down to the bare block because that's when it's going to be light and easy enough to move. So that's our next step. All right, you guys, that's going to be it for this video, but I really think we accomplished quite a bit today. As you can see, we got the cab off of the truck. We got the engine mostly disassembled. You saw me take the cylinder head off of there. I was able to inspect the cylinder bores. Still has really good factory cross hatching in there. There's no issues on the top side. I did drain what was left of the oil in there and it definitely has a silvery tinge to it. So yeah, we do have a bearing issue. But the question is, did it damage the block like it did on my 6.7? I'm really hoping not. I'm hoping this could be a simple swap, put a new crank in there, some new bearings, ship this thing. Really, really hoping. But I hope you guys like what you've seen so far. If you have, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Or if you feel like it, subscribe to the channel. If this isn't your thing, I have a lot of other automotive content on there that might be your thing. Mainly uh, Dodge Chrysler related with Hemis and stuff. But also my 6.4 Hemi Swap C10, it's a great project to check out if you haven't seen that before. But really guys, this is where I, I really wanna give you guys a heartfelt thank you because the channel's doing really well right now. It's really improving. 
And while I'm trying my best to give you guys a good experience every time, try to improve my videos every time, it's because of you guys. It's because of you watching and you engaging that the channel is growing. And that just means everything to me because this I'm putting everything I've got into this right now and you guys are responding to that. So it just makes me feel really good. And thank you again, guys, for absolutely everything. We'll see you next time on Reignited.